Space, the final frontier. This is the Observer's Notebook, the official podcast of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. Its mission to explore the solar system, to seek out new observations and data, to boldly go where no podcast has gone before. And now the host of the Observer's Notebook, Tim Robertson. Hello and welcome to the Observer's Notebook, the official podcast for the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. I'm Tim Robertson, your host of the podcast and also the coordinator of the training program within the ALPO. The Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers is an international organization devoted to the study of the sun, moon, planets, asteroids, meteors, and comets. Our goals are to stimulate, coordinate, and generally promote the study of these bodies using methods and instruments that are available within the communities of both amateur and professional astronomers. The Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers collects and analyzes observations of various solar system bodies and associated phenomena, and publishes those in, with detailed reports in the quarterly publication, the Journal of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers, otherwise known as the Strolling Astronomer. This podcast depends upon donations from you, our listeners, to keep it alive. If you enjoy what you hear on the Observer's Notebook, you can donate it to it via Patreon by giving as little as $1 a month. If you feel even more generous, for $5 you receive early access to the podcast before it goes public. For a monthly donation of $10, you receive a copy of the Novice Observer's Handbook. And for $35 a month, you will receive producer credits on the podcast. You can help us out by going to www.patreon.com slash Observer's Notebook. A reminder, the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers maintains many individual observing sections and programs devoted to the study of various solar system bodies and phenomena. Each is managed by one or more coordinators that collect and study the submitted observations. If you would like to join the ALPO, you can for as little as $14 a year. For more information, you can visit us on the internet at www.alpo-astronomy.org. And now, The Observer's Notebook. All right, I'd like to welcome everybody back to the Observer's Notebook podcast. Our special guest today is a repeat customer to the podcast, Rick Hill. Welcome back, Rick. Hi. Why don't you give everybody a little bit of background about yourself before we get started? Uh, Okay, I've been uh, doing amateur astronomy since May 1957. Uh, I am a pre-Sputnik kid, and... uh, um, began with the ALPO back in the mid-1970s after I got out of the Navy and uh, became a coordinator in 1982 when Walter Haas asked me to start the solar section. I worked in professional astronomy from 1979 uh, through the 80s. I worked on Kitt Peak at the uh, Schmidt Telescope Warner and Swayze Observatory. And then after that, I worked at the Lunar and Planetary Lab until I retired two years ago, two years ago this month, in fact. Fantastic. And our topic today is something I don't know too much about, but as the training program coordinator, I've been asked a lot about it. It is lunar and planetary and also some solar imaging. So a little primer to get started and what you need to know and what you need to do to actually start taking uh, some nice uh, lunar lunar and planetary astrophotos. Yeah, and of course you're asking for lunar, planetary, and solar, so this is like drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> yes, there's there's going to be a lot to talk about, so if you're listening to the podcast, sit back in your nice easy chair, or I hope you have a two-hour commute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, first I want to, if you can just explain the differences between lunar and planetary and solar observ- imaging. Um, okay, basically with solar observing, speed is the thing. And I'll mention that again um, because daytime seeing, and this is a maxim, daytime seeing is only one arc second 1% of the time. That's the old rule of thumb. And so what you're trying to do is catch those fractions of a second where the seeing is good and then have your software put that all together in a nice image. With planetary imaging, you're going for um, detail, but you're, you have more relaxed seeing conditions generally. Um, yeah, unless you live in an urban environment. And um, with the lunar observing, 
you're trying to catch areas of the moon. You, you're interested in seeing again, but you're trying to catch areas, and so your thoughts are about mosaics more than anything. Okay. So let's start off with uh, talking about lunar imaging, okay? Okay. What type of telescope or mount do you recommend? Um, okay, I'm real biased here. Um, I, for years, used Newtonians, and I've used refractors. Then I got a Questar, and I had a C-14 at the time, and I was blown away by how close the Questar came to matching the C-14 view. Really? And, and um, yeah, and I wondered why. And this is going to be something that applies to all three of these types of photography. Um, and that is general observing um, um, considerations. Uh, first, you need to evaluate your conditions. Um, the, with the C-14, I was, I was very baffled why a Questar would almost match it. So I started doing a, a series of experiments over two years using different apertures on the C-14 okay. to see what was happening. And it turned out, I discovered in that time, that the average seeing cell size on my property was 8 to 10 inches. That was well over 90% of the time. And so anything beyond 10 inches aperture was adding to the brightness of the image, but not the resolution in the image. In fact, it was actually decreasing the resolution of the image. So that, that's something to understand is what are those seeing cells like where you live and try to match your instrument to that. And um, Well, that sounds like a topic to discuss in itself. <laughs> It, it is, it is, and uh, well, in fact, uh, uh, Richard Sweeter uh, wrote a whole book on it, and um, also, do you have a say, haze source nearby, um, like aircraft, do you have a lot of aircraft, are you uh, underneath a flight path to, say, um, Phoenix to San Diego or something, so you're going to get a lot of those uh, contrails. As they degrade during the night, they spread out and they create haze in your sky. Uh, do you have frequent wind problems? That's a huge problem here in Tucson are the desert winds at night. And uh, you have to take steps to either limit those or you have to give up a few nights uh, a month to wind. Um, uh, a lot of asphalt. Is there a lot of asphalt surrounding your site? Um, if so, what can you do about it? Are there other specific heat sources at your site. My old observatory, which is in town in Tucson, used to have a heat problem, and I wound a um, sprinkling hose on the roof of it, and I would turn it on for a couple minutes before I would start an observing session, <laughs> and that would bleed the heat off of the building, and it took a lot of heat away from the uh, the site. Um, another consideration... Sure, it was some strange looks from your neighbors, though, right? <laughs> uh, Why are you watering your roof? <laughs> when they found out I was an amateur astronomer, and that I was up till two or three in the morning on normal nights. Strange was just part of the. Uh, so, uh, also another consideration is trees. Do you have to uh, plan a regular tree trimming uh, um, plan, so to speak? Uh, I do. I have mesquites to the east of me, and I have to cut the mesquite back at regular intervals. And then again, of course, excessive lighting. Most amateur astronomers know about that mm -hmm. and what they have to do about that. Try to talk to your local uh, uh, city authorities on that, see if you can get some shields and things like that. Okay, now for lunar observing, which is where you wanted to start, I found at my property that the best seeing that I get is the first hour of the night after sunset. Hmm. I'm, I'm often done by the time it's dark. Wow. So that limits you to what phases of the moon, too, you can really look at. Well, I, when I want to do later phases, I just have to put up with whatever the sky okay. gives me. Do you find the scene um, is better right after sunset? Oh, I'm very stable. I get subarc second seeing for oh that goodness. first hour of the night. Yeah. Um, but it frequently degrades because I have the Rincon Mountains to the east of me. And the cold air on those mountains slides off. You can literally see it in an anemometer in my backyard that the wind direction will change and once it comes from the mountain you're done because that's cold air coming off the mountain and it really destroys the seeing for hours huh. um, now what type of telescope for the moon any telescope will work um, even Dobson's 
Uh, there's a lot of good lunar photography being done by amateurs with Dobson telescopes. Um, uh, you do need uh, good tracking, but not like deep sky observing where you have to track for you know many minutes. Um, but you should be able to track for a few seconds at a time with a Dobson mount and one of those platform trackers. Okay. Um, and the telescope, I prefer a long focus telescope, but I don't like refractors because, as I said before, I have a wind problem here. Mm. And, and a refractor is nothing more than a way to measure the wind. <laughs> so um, I, I uh, after falling in love with the Questar, went to look for a, a larger version of the same telescope, and I now have an 8-inch F20 TEC Moxitov Cassegrain. Oh, my goodness. And so it is only for lunar and planetary observing. It's it's really not good for much else. Double stars, and um, so some decent tracking. Um, a long focal length is nice. If not, if you have an f4, f5, um, using using some of the nice Barlows that are out now uh, is is the way to go. And you'll have to match that to your telescope. As it turns out, Barlows don't work well with my telescope. Because almost all the Barlows today are um, designed to work with Schmidt Cassegrains or refractors, all of whom have a curved focal plane that is curved in a sense towards the um, objective, whereas with the Maksudov, they're curved in the other way. Mm. So it just doesn't work well at all. Okay. Uh, but at F20, with the cameras I use, uh, you have to match your camera to your focal ratio because you want to do what's called Nyquist sampling. That's where um, you have a, a, you don't want your pixel and your resolution element to be the same. If your telescope resolves half an arc second, you don't want half an arc second to be one pixel. You want a couple of pixels in that half arc second. Okay. So when that moment comes when you have perfect seeing, you capture everything possible for your aperture. So... Um, the, it's the complicated version of that is Nyquist sampling, but just oversampling is is simply good enough, and usually a factor of two works well for that. And uh, that's at f20 with the Skyris cameras that I use that are made by Celestron, and a lot of the other cameras have this. I think it's a Sony chip. It's got 3.74 micron pixels. It turns out that's a perfect match. And what camera is that again? Uh, I use the Skyris, the Celestron Skyris cameras. Okay. They're a CCD camera, and um, uh, so with my with my uh, observing conditions, my telescope, and everything, that works perfectly. And on the best nights at perigee, and I, I'm telling you, when you get down to the kind of observing I'm talking about, apogee and perigee matter. Hmm. Um, and at perigee, uh, I can. Quite comfortably imaged down to one kilometer on the moon. Whoa! <laughs> so theoretically, I should be able to get down to 0. 0.9 kilometer, but wow. I've I've not not verified that. I use the L Rock images, which are online uh, from Arizona State University, the the um, orbiter over the lunar orbiter images, and they go down to something like 100 meter, I think. Resolution. Oh, so that's a, that's how you measure your resolution. Right. Comparing right. it to those other photographs. Okay, I see. Exactly. Wow. So the okay, so the the, the Celestron camera you use is it, do you use it for all three lunar, planetary, and solar? Yes. Okay. So this is the one standard camera that you'd recommend, pretty much. Well, it's not just one camera. I have a color one and I have a, a monochromatic one. Okay. Before that, I had two cameras made by Image Source. That one was uh, color and the other was monochromatic. But um, I'm very, in fact, I understand Image Source makes the Skyris cameras. I'm just very happy with their product. Okay. Yeah, I think when I was first looking for one, I asked you what you use, and you told me, and I went out and bought it. And I've experimented a little bit with the moon, but I look at your photographs, and I'm like, uh, I'll get there eventually. <laughs> um, well, like I say, don't be, don't hesitate to, to uh, blow that image up. Yeah. That's the thing. Um, we, we see so many whole disk images of the moon. And you're not going to see the exciting stuff when you're looking at the whole disk at one time. The the devil's in the details, as they say. That's true. And um, so for for the moon, you use monochromatic, a monochromatic camera. Or if you have a color camera or you're using a DSLR, use it in monochromatic mode. Um, and then try to 
limit the spectral response. Um, I like to use red filters. I use 665 nanometers, and I also use a wideband 656 uh, nanometer filter. And those are both in the red, deep red. And uh, that does several things. Number one, it limits haze. Scattered light is blue. That's why the sky is blue. Um, and so this helps to limit haze. It also helps to reduce seeing problems uh, that might be color-related. And it also reduces ac um, atmospheric uh, refraction. And so as the moon gets lower, in fact, if, if you just get 10 degrees off of zenith, it's not possible, a wide band, to do better than one arc second imaging because the atmospheric refraction will get you. Wow. Um, so uh, these, this was all uh, detailed in the uh, ALPO Solar Section Handbook, the old one. And we're still waiting for the League to publish the uh, Observe and Understand the Sun, which will be our handbook. And they haven't done it yet. Um, what about exposure times that you use with the camera when you're doing the moon? Well, you want to go fast because you're trying to give your software the opportunity to select the best images. In fact, today's stacking software doesn't just select the best images. It selects the best portion from the best images and then reassembles them like a jigsaw puzzle. And um, what, soft uh, what software is that? Okay. Um, there, there's... Um, Registax, which if it's a good night and I don't have wind shaking the telescope at all, I can use Registax software, um, and that's a freeware. I'm, I'm a big believer in freeware, and so uh, that's a freeware that's out there. I understand Photoshop now can do stacking as well, and uh, if it's a night where I'm dealing with wind, fighting wind or fighting seeing, I'll um, prefer AVI Stack 2, which is also a freeware. But it deals with the image a little differently than Registax and can handle more image motion than Registax can. Hmm. Okay. And those are both freeware? Yeah. Okay. Um, how about your method for lunar imaging? What, what, walk me through your process that you do. Well, um, you want a good image, but you don't want, it to, you don't want the image to have so much gain or such a low exposure time that the brightest areas on the craters that are being illuminated are saturated. You don't want that. Uh, you want to be able to see detail in that, those bright areas. So you want to get, get balance your exposure time to do that. But also you want to do it as fast as you can so you freeze the seeing as best as you can. Um, the other philosophy, it's all a balancing act. So the other philosophy is you also want to overlap. You cannot uh, be too generous with your overlap in lunar imaging. And you'll find that out the first time you put a mosaic together of something you thought was going to be so beautiful and fantastic, and there's a chunk missing out of the middle of it where they didn't overlap. Now, what, what, what do you mean? I, I know what overlap means, but what do you mean by overlap? I mean, explain to me what you... Well, the, the cameras, when you're sampling at the rate I was talking about before, your camera field of view is going to be small. Right. And um, like the crater um, Ptolemaeus mm -hmm. in the middle of the moon, that'll fill a frame. And so you want to get Alphonsus and Arzatchel up above it there, too, or down below it depending on whether you're south up or north up, you're going to have to do them separately and then put them together with, oh, some software like, uh, oh, I use iMerge is another piece of freeware, hmm. or uh, Auto Stitch, And they will literally put the images together if you have good overlap and make one larger image out of that. So you can do larger portions of the moon. I've known people that have put whole disks images of the moon together using all these close-ups and really? they, something like 64 images or something that, you better have a lot of memory <laughs> that's 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 true um okay speaking of memory how about computers what 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 other what computer requirements for imaging do you think we need oh i put my own together so i i make the the requirements i want i buy up computers by lots as offices 
get rid of their laptops and get all brand new laptops. I'll buy up the old ones in lots on eBay. And then I take the pieces out that I want and I put them together and get the memory I want and the speeds I want. And um, so I'm using ThinkPads right now. Um, but I was using uh, Compaq before, but they stopped making those, so nobody gets rid of those anymore. How much memory are we talking that you, you recommend that a good laptop or? I'm using 8 gigs, okay. uh, which is not an uncommon or unreasonable amount of memory. But it's you kind of have to have, I think, you could probably get away with 2 gigs, but you're not going to do a lot of heavy-duty processing. You're going to be able to run Registax and and uh, uh, AVI stack and, and auto stitch and things like that. But um, you won't be able to handle like eight images and trying to put that together as a mosaic. Okay. Now, for the processing, you have Registax is, a, is the software you're using or the AVI? Uh, AVI stack or Registax is the ones I use. There are other softwares out there that will do the same job. Uh, I can't speak to them because I don't use them. Okay. Uh, I also don't use Photoshop. I use another program called GIMP, which is also freeware. <laughs> I used to write an article in a local astronomy newsletter about freewares that you could get and use for astronomy, and that's why I have a computer full of it now. Yeah. So, so uh, walk me walk me through a normal lunar imaging session. Okay. Well, I, I, I'll go out, and beforehand, I'll use uh, Virtual Moon Atlas, also freeware. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you seeing a pattern here? I, I, that's what, you're cheap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I use, I use uh, Virtual Moon Atlas, which is an excellent program. It comes in three flavors, one for uh, portable devices, uh, one for laptops, and then one for uh, desktops with outrageous amounts of memory. Um, and uh, I use that to see what is going to be available on the Terminator or what the libration of the moon is. Maybe maybe Mare Oriental is going to be visible tonight, and I want to go over and do the limb instead of the Terminator. Mm. And so I'll, um, I'll check it out on, on Virtual Moon Atlas and plan it out. Then I'll go and I'll, I'll look and see how many images do I need to cover this feature. Do I maybe only need to overlap two images? Uh, I put out one yesterday on Facebook, and I frequently put my images on Facebook. Um, I put one out yesterday showing the um, the, the uh, Zacchaeus uh, Schiller Basin, and it's not well known to a lot of amateur astronomers. And as Chuck Wood pointed out to me yesterday, it wasn't well known to me either. He showed me a better map of it, and I was able to update my image and show it better. But um, that only took one image. Oh, to show okay. that, but I'm that was an image where I was working at a kilometer and a half resolution. Okay, so so while you're imaging the moon, um, the exposure. Okay, you're, you're stacking images. How, how long? What period of time? Ah, you're you're just taking AVIs. You're just taking raw data okay. when you're out of the telescope. How long just, of a video though? Uh, I usually stick to anywhere from twelve hundred to three thousand frames per AVI. Okay. I usually don't go over 3,000, and usually I don't even do 3,000 except for the planets, where I need to stack more images to get a better uh, signal-to-noise ratio. Um, so I'll be out there, I'll be photographing the moon, taking AVIs of these different areas, making sure I've got good overlap. And it will, will not be unusual to take 200 gigabytes worth of data. Hmm. So I cannot stress this enough. Get yourself a disk that's too big. Uh, a terabyte disk is not too big. Uh, you'll find that out really quick, especially if you're an avid observer and you go out every clear night. Uh, I literally, in Arizona, since we have like 310 or 320 clear nights a year, I have to actually kiss off some nights and just stay in and process data. Because uh, my computer's filling up. Oh my goodness! Yeah, uh, and and if you're a, the kind of person that wants to, I recommend saving all the steps of your work as you go through. Um, you have a raw image that's that's uh, the AVI. I don't save the AVIs because they're just too big. Right. They're easily 
two and three gigabytes each. Um, some people do. Some people want to put them on DVDs and Blu-rays. If you want to punish yourself that way, uh, plan on having a lot of shelves in a separate room for an archive room because you're going to fill it up really fast. Um, but then you get one image that comes out after you stack an AVI. So your five, three to five gigabyte AVI is now down to one image that's a couple of megabytes. And I recommend keeping the images, the output from stacking, I recommend keeping it in TIFF or FITS or BMP because um, those preserve the data better. They don't, um, uh, oh, what's the word? Um, well, JPEG uh, s subsamples, and you don't want to do that. Oh, okay. You go to JPEG for your very last step when you need to make the image smaller so you can mail it or you can post it on Facebook. But don't do it in the intermediate stages. Good and, tip. Yeah, and uh, and and that um, I do all that processing inside later uh, with a cup of coffee in one hand. Okay. Uh, not, at, not at the telescope. Telescope time is too precious. Uh, and if you've got good seeing, you want to use the seeing. You don't want to be wasting any time processing. Okay. Anything else to add for lunar imaging? Uh, for lunar imaging, um, like I said, the overlap is probably the, the, the uh, biggest thing to recommend. And I do recommend using the red filters. And uh, uh, you'll, just, you'll just find it works better that way. Um, but, no, that, that's pretty much it. You'll, to get a person going, don't be afraid to use magnification. Um, you work at f20 uh, something like that with your telescope get Barlow's in there or whatever to work around f20 okay all right let's switch over to planetary imaging now right telescope same scope that you're using now uh, yes same telescope I have one scope that I use for all I either use the Questar or I use the eight inch and on rare occasions when I'm in a remote site I'll use the Celestron 5. But that works at F10, so I have to use Barlow with that. And, uh, uh, again, uh, I, uh, any telescope will do. I've seen excellent planetary images done, even with Dobson telescopes. So it's just how much are you willing to put up with as far right. as the telescope goes. If you're willing to put up with the Dobson tracking platform and everything and having to reset that every once in a while, you're fine. Um I do not do RGBL imaging of the planets. Uh, I use a color camera. And, uh, and that's that Celestron camera. Yeah. Uh, I use the 132C for, for uh, planetary imaging. Um, I have not had good results. I know people that have. Chris Go berates me all the time for using a color camera. Um, and, but, you know, you've got Damien Peach and Chris Go. They break it down and do it by filter and everything. Right. But it takes me too much time to go from one filter to the next, refocus, shoot with that filter, go to the third filter, refocus, shoot. And by that time, Jupiter's rotated quite a ways. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, another piece of freeware you're going to have to get familiar with, especially for planetary, is Win Jupos. W I N. J-U-P-O-S and uh, that will derotate your images Oh, wow! using that software so if you put Jupiter in there and you put your three images it'll derotate it but you might have some funny effects around the edge okay. um, so and it just I didn't get good results with it I do get good results with the color camera um, I also like to shoot a lot when I'm shooting planets um, like Jupiter or um, uh, Mars, something like that. I like to go out every anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour and then shoot it as it rotates during the night. And, uh, yes, I have to put up with bad seeing lots of times, but uh, it works It works well enough. And um, with the Questar, I'm shooting through the Questar with a 1.7x Barlow, so it's working at f24.5. So you get a little so, bit of magnification going on there too. Yeah, yeah, I do, and uh, it really holds up well. I, 
I just can't say enough good things about their optics. Yeah. Uh, it's so, a good little scope. I've looked through them many times and always been impressed. Um, so I have not used DSLR on the planets. You can do it. You will get a noisier image. You can take multiple images with the DSLR and add those, co-add those with Registax or uh, with AVI Stack. No, not with AVI Stacks. You have to use Registax or Photoshop for that. But um, you can get good planetary images doing that, too. Now, I know in visual observing, the key with planetary is the scene. You mentioned scene conditions with the moon, but with planetary... That's when it's really, they get really beat up your images, I'm sure. Yeah, there's many nights I go out and, you know, you want to shoot at opposition when the planet, like Mars, at opposition, which means sunsets out of the question. So uh, many nights I get out there, I get set up because I have a rollout observatory. My telescope rolls out of a, uh, a shed on wheels. And I'll get all set up and the scene's just too bad and I have to roll it all back in. Um, just nothing you can do about it. Uh, with the planets, I do a minimum of three AVIs for each set. And they're usually separated by a minute or so. And then I'll use that program Win Jupos to go ahead, derotate them, and co add the images to give me a final result that's a nice low noise image. Hmm. And it works with, it's, I think it's set for all the planets. I've used it on Uranus and Neptune as well. Oh, wow. Now, what about image size? I mean, is there a, a minimum image size that you're going to start shooting? What do you mean by size? It's the, the, the arc second of the planet. Oh, I do the same thing as on the moon. Um, I'm using that oversampling scheme. And really what that means is, if the seeing is perfect, you'll catch all the resolution your telescope has to offer, if your focus is good. Right. And that's another thing. I, I have a micrometer focuser on the TEC telescope, and my Celestrons do too. I highly recommend getting a test tube holder. A test tube holder? You, cl you clip it on to the, the micrometer, mm -hmm. and then you only need one finger. Oh. Focus the telescope. You oh. don't shake the telescope. Really save some time in focusing. This is one of those tricks that <laughs> you learn over the years. Huh? That's interesting. Yeah, just, you can yeah. even make them. You know, uh, you can. I, I've made them out of popsicle sticks and medicine containers. You know, that slip over the uh, the micrometer, so that you just use the popsicle stick as a lever arm. Um, any way you can keep from shaking that telescope is going to save you time. Yeah, I have an electronic focuser on my telescope. I just hit a button and it moves a little bit. Yeah, interesting. So, yeah, well, you expect me to be cheap. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, magnification. What what are you looking for? I've never calculated the magnification. Oh, okay. I mean, uh, um, I work at that oversampling so that two of my resolution elements uh, fits across one pixel. So, um, And I've never worried about the magnification beyond that because it's sort of irrelevant. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I have had very good results. You know, people can go to my uh, Facebook page or my web page, and uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of my results there. Right. And uh, I, I need to update the web page. That's a very time-consuming thing. But uh, Facebook's so much easier. Well, I've you know, I've got about 300 lunar images that need to make it to my lunar image archive on my web page. I set up my lunar image archive with the same format as the lunar orbiter uh, archive at uh, um, Space Science Institute because they just had a really nice layout. And so I just copied their software, and uh, so you can look up different craters, and then click on it, and it'll give you the image. Huh. Interesting. So, so for planetary imaging, walk me through again your process for doing this. How do you? Um, well, you you get on on the planet, of course. Is I, if I can get on it in twilight, that's better. But you get on it, and, and of course you first evaluate the scene. Mm -hmm. Don't waste your time if the seeing's bad, um, because you'll process and process and process, and you'll still have garbage. Um, 
just work on the best nights. And um, uh, like I say, I take three AVIs to a set. So I may do one set, say, at uh, 8 o'clock in the evening and then come back at 8.30 or quarter to 9 and do another set. And then, and then I could put them, like if they're Jupiter, I can put them all together on one page. When I after I process the images, you can watch Jupiter rotate and the satellites go across, and or you can make a movie. But you have to come out and do a set about every ten minutes if you're going to do that. Now, each set, how many images are we talking? Uh, we're talking about three AVIs. Each one of them will be about three thousand images. Okay. And of those, depending on the seeing, now on a night of mediocre seeing, you maybe will only use thirty to forty percent of a given AVI. Just have the software pick out the best ones. On a really good night, you might use 50 or even 60% of the images. But still, that's going to be a lot of images, and that's going to really give you a nice low-noise image. Okay. So on, on, a, on a good night, uh, you're, so you're, you're keeping like 60%? Yeah. Okay. Interesting. But I let, the, I let the software do that inside later on. Right. Uh, when I'm running, when I'm running uh, Registax, it lets you either pick the number of images you want to combine or the percentage of the images in the AVI you want to combine. So when you make that determination, do you actually watch the AVI to see how clear it is? No, okay. no, because um, if it's having to, you got three thousand images. If the software is having to paste those images each time on the screen, you're really eating up a lot of overhead. You're computing overhead. And it's going to take you a long time to do the uh, the processing. You're better off to just let it work blind. Okay. And and uh, let it use all your uh, um, your your uh, computing power, all your uh, uh, RAM uh, for the just the processing, and not uh, showing you uh, pictures. Now, for planetary, do you use any filters, or do you just use the uh, the color camera? I use the color camera, and in Registax is a nice little feature, and it's probably in Photoshop and these other things too, that'll let you align the three colors, RGB, to each other, so you can take out atmospheric refraction. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. Oh, that, back in the old days when we were shooting with film, uh, I started photographing back in the 1960s, and just, you know, you had to live with, uh, for, uh, with atmospheric refraction. Right. Or you shot in black and white. Those were your choices. Interesting. Okay. Do you have anything else to add on planetary imaging? Uh, well, let's see here. Um, like I say, you want to get a good signal. Don't don't skimp on the gain or the the. Uh, um, don't lower the exposure time and make it so fast, so short that you get a weak image, or you're just going to be a noisy image. And that's going to all result in a better image for you. Okay. Well, great. Now the sun. And we're are we talking? We're just talking white light, correct? Yeah. Okay. Uh, white light and broad uh, broadband. Uh, I use broadband CAK, the or, or calcium K line. That's the filter that Botter sells. That's a pretty nifty filter. It doesn't require any special equipment. You just put it on your camera like any other filter. And you, uh, it broadband filters over the uh, K line. The K line's a really fat line, many, many, many times wider than H alpha, and and so uh, you can get away with it here. Um, I do mostly uh, white light, and at my house, I using the eight inches irrelevant. I can't get good images in the daytime with it. All right. My seeing just is not good enough, so I use the Questar, and I get granulation usually through the Questar. Uh, in the daytime, the old, like I say, the old maxim is one arc second seeing about 1% of the time. And so, uh, again, I go out and on each each uh, sunspot group that I want to photograph, I do three sets. And I focus in between each one because the focus is changing all the time in the daytime. It's much worse than night. Hmm. And uh, um, uh, and you'll you'll see when you process them that one looks just a little bit sharper, a little bit better than the other ones. And uh, I'll do that for each sunspot group. Uh, I used to do whole disk image too, but 
it just got to be too much processing, uh, and and so I'm just doing the individual groups now. Okay, uh, and um, and uh, the exposure you used, you use, use small AVIs or. I um usually yeah with the sun you don't need need to, you have plenty of light right so so the, literally the amount of light coming through is not an issue uh, you're using a full aperture filter mm -hmm. um, uh, a botter filter used for visual will work perfectly well for taking images and you'll be working near a thousandth of a second exposure time um, if you get the Botter filter that's thinner for photographic use only. Um, you'll have to be very careful. You don't uh, look in the eyepiece. There's always the temptation to look in, but um, you'll be working down around two thousand, three thousandth of a second. You'll be freezing the scene for sure. Oh, okay, good, good, good. Um, and software is the same that you used before. Uh, yes, people have used DSLs, DSLRs to a very good. Uh, 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 result with the, with the sun, um, but freezing the scene is the primary goal. Again, you're going to pile up images pretty quick if we have good activity on the sun, which we aren't having right now. Right, right. Uh, we had a nice sunspot group, uh, a couple of them uh, back um, just before the eclipse, and uh, that that uh, provided some excitement yeah. but again the, the uh, processing tips are about the same um, I should mention for all of these that uh, I'm using the, the iCap software for capture, image capture that's provided by Celestron with their SkyRis cameras so I've just been using that it works perfectly well yeah I've um, played with that I like it it's, it's pretty intuitive I mean it yeah that's what that's that's what I like about it. There's not as many bells and whistles as something like fire capture. Uh, fire capture's got a lot of good things about it, and one of the good things is that it keeps real nice logs of all the image processing you do. So if you ever have to go back through and see what you did wrong, uh, you can do that fairly easily. There's another one that's even more simple, which is called WX Astro Capture. And I've used that. I used to use that a lot back in the days of the 2U cams. Oh, yeah. Um, I built and, one of those once. <laughs> and uh, I've, I've still got a few of them laying around. And uh, it's just hard to throw out the children, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, there's, other, there's other softwares for, uh, for uh, data capture like Astro Snaps and K, K3CCD tools which I have not used in years, so I can't speak to it. Okay. So that's the sun. Now, you, you, you said you used to be a film astrophotographer. Yes, sir. How much, how much did you have to retrain yourself going from film to uh, imaging? CCD well, imaging? okay, <laughs> I, I cheated. Um, in the film days, I was in the, in the 60s as an amateur. I was in there hypersensitizing film in ammonia and then 100% uh, isopropyl alcohol in the dark room and so they'd keep your sinuses clear <laughs> and uh, I, I was doing that kind of hypering and then after I got out of the Navy um, I took a few pictures, Tri-X, things like that mm -hmm. and then went to work at Kitt Peak when I got the job with um, Case and there I was doing photographic plates and the um, I did all the plates for the northern half of the uh, Michigan Spectral Atlas. Oh my! Which covered the whole sky, and I learned how to hypersensitize with hydrogen gas at that time. And uh, um, from there, they went to, with that telescope to digital late in the uh, 1980s, early 1990s. Oh, so you had on-the-job training. <laughs> right. Exactly. And, oh, I'm telling you, those are 1K chips, uh, one, uh, 1K by 1K chips, and they took eight minutes to read out. Uh. I know. They had an O-scope on the observing table. You could actually watch the trace go up the O-scope as it was reading out across the chip. It was excruciating. But uh, I learned how to start processing those images there. I learned how to process images with IRAF. Learned how to write scripts in IRAF, and 
Yeah, I, I learned um, Fortran in 1972 in college. Paper tapes, punch cards. Right. And uh, since then, I taught myself seven other languages and was processing and writing software in those languages. So um, I, I've, I've done it from literally, it's, it's like making a loaf of bread by growing wheat first. And uh, um, so I've, I've had to do it that way. Today, it's beautiful. I wouldn't go back to a dark room for love nor money. Um, <laughs> I hear, I hear no more, you. No more black fingernails and all of that. Um, and it's I can't. I wonder how much those photochemicals have shortened my lifespan. Oh, but um, <laughs> there's, I was there's a pleasant a thought. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I I just love the the ability to do what we can do today. Unsharp masking used to be a week long process. Mm. For astrophotography, and today it, it's a five-minute thing. Right. Um, it's 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 amazing. When I was a kid, for example, um, this is in the late 1950s. The 200-inch telescope on three AJ plates would get down to 19th magnitude in in an hour and a half. On the Schmidt telescope that I was using before I retired, it was a 28-inch Schmidt. We were photographing the sky, looking for earth impacting asteroids and would get to 20th magnitude 20.5 in 30 seconds <laughs> there's no way I'd go back to the horrible days of film yeah plates and film oh yeah. god yeah so this is this is eminently better yeah so lessons learned what do you what some advice to those that want to get started in lunar and planetary and solar astrophotography what what, what do you recommend Number one rule, back up, back up, back up. Always back up your work. Uh, the worst thing in the world is to go out, do a whole night's worth of work. It's the best night you ever saw. You come in and you have a disc crash. And though it's going to happen. And uh, this is not the kind of stuff that you can have. You know those backup services that will back up all your computer? Right. Uh, AVIs, they won't like you very long if you're, if you're backing up AVIs, 5 gigabyte AVIs. Um, when processing, always save your earlier steps. So you can't save too many steps in the processing because you're going to make a mistake somewhere down the line. You're going to say, oh, if I could do that over again. Well, you can. And it's, it doesn't take up that much space. Yeah, software might change. All sorts of things might change, too, that you can just... Take an old image and make it nicer. I've got I've got a big box in the garage full of videotapes from the videotape days of the 1990s. Ugh. And I'm so tempted to go back and reprocess some of that data. To digitize but them all. Again, but then again, I'm 68 right now, and I don't think I've got the years to go back and reprocess all that data. Um so, Isn't the rule uh, you, you can't die if you start a project like that, though, and you have, you have to finish it? <laughs> yeah, that's like buying an insurance policy that matures in 20 years, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, um, another word uh, of, to the wise is you cannot overestimate the amount of disk space you're going to need. Uh, with multi-terabyte disks out there, go ahead and spend the money. It's money well spent. Um and uh, if, if you keep your AVIs, you're going to have to make a major investment in DVDs and Blu-ray discs anyway. So, um, but you know, the days of gigabytes should be behind you if you're going to do astro imaging, um, unless you're going to do it on a very limited scale. Now it's days of terabytes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we're looking down the road at petabyte. With the uh, Catalina Sky Survey uh, that I was working at, each image... At the time I was there two years ago, it was 35 uh, uh, megabytes. The images are now four times that size. And they've got a RAID system of multi terabyte disks just so they can keep the data at fingertips distance. So, uh, yeah, uh, the, the days of petabyte are coming really, really fast. That will be interesting. How many movies can we put on that? <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> uh, for those that want to get 
started in, in, in astrophotography, lunar, planetary, solar astrophotography. It's the same thing I would say now that we've always said in the solar section of the ALPO. Use what you got, get going now. Don't wait for the perfect system. Good advice. Yeah, um, use the you know, telescope you have. It's, if all you got is a 2.4-inch refractor and you want to start doing lunar, planetary, and solar photography, plan your observing so you're not, you're not trying to photograph details on the Jovian moons with a 2.4-inch telescope, but maybe you're just trying to photograph the movements of the Jovian moons around Jupiter over an, uh, a night or two and make a movie out of it. Or, yeah, the eclipses of the moons, things like that as well. Yeah, yeah. but they're, they're, use the equipment you've got, but plan your observing so that it's reasonable for the equipment that you've got. Don't try to, to be the large binocular telescope with a small reflect, refractor in your backyard. Uh, the, the, the idea is to get going. And if, if the only camera you've got is a webcam, use it. You'll be surprised how much it can do. Yeah. Well, even even the Celestron telescope that yeah, when I asked you about it, it's it's like two hundred and fifty dollars. It's not it's not real expensive. I mean, it's it's something you can really get started with if you've got the budget for it. But I I know kids that have picked up a, a four inch reflector at a garage sale or something, and all they've got is this webcam and it, and uh, you know what brand is a webcam? I don't know. It says China on it. <laughs> um, and and I'll I'll say put it up to the IP start taking pictures, uh, just try it. See, um, I I frequently take the Quest Star to barbecues and parties and things like that, and the Moon will be up or Venus will be up or Jupiter or something, and I show them how to take pictures of that through the eyepiece with their cell phones, uh. and they go they go home like they've got treasures. Mm -hmm. So um, it it the thing is to just get out there and get going and. So many people are doing more and more amazing work with the uh, cell phones. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm. I'm just. Well, the cameras away. on the phones now are amazing. I mean, it's. They're getting very good. Yeah. And, uh, so, um, so let's see. What else uh, you asked? Oh, what was my learning curve like? Well, the learning curve. Get somebody to help you along, even if it's just online. Um, there's a number of Facebook pages where people help each other out all the time. There's a number of Yahoo um, mail lists where people help each other out all the time. Um, get yourself um, a guide, so to speak, that can help you through the trials and tribulations of getting started and getting on that learning curve. Because once you're on it, you're going to be having so much fun, you won't even notice how steep it is. That's great. That's great. What are your future plans in astrophotography? Any equipment out there that you're looking to get in, or well, types I of would, imaging? Well, I would dearly love to get a whole. As I say, I analyze my sight, and I could go up to a 10 inch. I would dearly love to get the 10 inch f20 TEC. Uh, the TE, the optics in my TEC are perfect. I've got on my um, um, Facebook page on my website. Pictures of double stars I've taken down to half an arc second separation with that scope. So uh, I, I can't want for better optics, and I would love to get the 10 inch version of that. But they may. Uh, Yuri is the optician at TEC, and he only makes refractors now. Mm. And uh, I, I say a refractor in my yard is is kind of useless. Yeah, it's a, wind, uh, but, it's a sale. <laughs> yeah. The 10 inch would be a really nice thing to have, and it would be nice to be able to uh, just up my game a little bit. Yeah. Well, Rick, do you have anything else to add before we close this out? Under an hour. <laughs> <laughs> we did it in under an hour. Uh, I tell you, I wouldn't want to be on the listening end of this and trying to take notes. <laughs> <laughs> well, if people want to have questions for you, how could they get a hold of you? <laughs> I'm on Facebook. There you go. And I'll I'm put on your... Facebook, and I'm in uh, my. Uh, Email address is on the ALPO uh, webpage um, under the solar section, and uh, I'm I'm a very accessible person. Unfortunately, if you type R I K Hill on in a in a, a search engine, you'll come up with plenty of me. <laughs> Some of it will be paleontology too, because that's another one of my hobbies. Oh my goodness, really? 
half of my garage is filled with fossils, everything from a T-Rex leg bone down to microfossils. That's that's what I did not know that about you. That's very interesting. Wow. Well, you, I also I also collect uh, uh, um, injured stray cats. <laughs> I think you had mentioned that stick. to me before. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Well, Rick, this has been a lot of fun, and uh, I'll put your email address and contact information in the show notes as well. Sure, fine. That's fine. Uh, I'm very accessible. All right. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast. Good talking to you. Well, that'll do it for this episode of the Observer's Notebook Podcast. I again want to thank our guest, Rick Hill, for coming on. We upload a new episode of the Observer's Notebook every few weeks. You can subscribe to us on iTunes. If you do, please rate and review us. I really appreciate it. You can also listen to us on SoundCloud. The link is in the show notes. And we're also available on Google Play and Stitcher. You can help support the podcast by donating to it via Patreon. You can give as little as $1 a month, up to $35 a month, well, where you will receive one year's membership to the ALPO and also be noted as a producer for the podcast. With that, I really want to thank the producer of this podcast, Steve Seidentop, for his generous support of the Observer's Notebook. The link for the Observer's Notebook and the link for Patreon are both in the show notes. You can contact me via email at cometman at cometman.net or on Twitter at at observers n b pod that's at observers n b that stands for notebook pod if you're interested in joining the alpo membership begins at only 14 dollars a year you can find out more at www.alpo-astronomy.org we're also on facebook the alpo astronomy just search for that in the search box on top or the podcast also has a facebook page just go searching for the observer's notebook the ALPO is an international organization devoted to the study of the sun, moon, planets, asteroids, meteors, and comets. Our goals are to stimulate, coordinate, and generally promote the study of these bodies using methods and instruments that are available within the communities of both amateur and professional astronomers. Until next time, my hope is you always have clear and steady skies. Thanks for listening. <laughs>